I am Katie Chapman. Hopefully you are in the right session. This should tell you whether you are or not. If you're not, I won't be offended if you leave. Um, I promise. <laughs> um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the scholarly commons very, very, very briefly. First, who already feels like they have an idea, understanding of what the scholarly commons is or what it's aiming for? Anyone? Sort of, okay, a lot of iffy, okay, that's just great. Um, this is a question that is on, if you go to Force 11 and you go to the working groups, the Scholarly Commons working group is where this work with the Scholarly Commons is happening, um, or at least where it originated, and it's happening some various places now, which is wonderful to see things spread. This is a question that the working group is aiming to try and approach. This is a logo that was used um, for the Scholarly Commons. It's on the Scholarly Commons website. But I want you guys to think of yourselves today as sitting in this circle. And we're all sitting together, but we're aiming somewhere. We're headed somewhere together. And that is the idea of the Scholarly Commons. It's not just about scholarship. It's beyond that. It's more than that. And it's a group effort. That's part of why I had you guys kind of come come together is that this is a group effort. Um, Kristen Rattan yesterday talked about in her keynote, she was talking about um, how, we can, how we can get behind something altogether. And I feel like there are things that we can all really get behind, otherwise we wouldn't be here. <laughs> there are things that we care about. We might have a lot of disagreements, but I think when we get rid of a lot of the trappings, a lot of what is at the core of it, we're all kind of on the same page. It might be, that page may be colored differently and it might have scribbles instead of straight lines and that's okay. But when we set aside that part of the page, what's at the heart of what we care about, this thing called scholarship, it matters to everyone that is here. Um, Yesterday, John Chidaki, he talked about success metric, um, and he described it as a community that we can enable. And I thought that was such a beautiful, beautiful thought. And so that's kind of what we're going for. But here's the thing. We all have tribes. I've heard that phrase used several times this weekend, um, or week. I'm thinking weekend. I'm wishful thinking, I guess. Um, but we all have groups that we are part of, whether we're a librarian, whether we're a researcher, whether we're tenure track or not tenure track or whatever those things that connect us, we all have those, those things that we affiliate with and things that we connect with, whether it's a geographic thing, um, a background thing. Um, for instance, people ask me this week, what do you do? Well, I'm a professional mom. That's my job. That's my full-time gig. And I have that affinity with other full-time moms. That's something that binds us to each other. But I have so many other things that bind me to so many other groups. Hence, I'm at Force 2018 instead of home with my kids this week. Um, there are different things that are going to bind us. But the scholarly commons is a nested thing. So at least the way that I think of it, I think of scholarly commons, lots of commons, all those different groups. And then together, they come together to form like this bigger commons where we can all come together and we can share. But if we're going to get to that point, we have to understand the needs of all of those different commonses. A little utopian? Yes, totally. I fully admit that. However, if we don't at least try to understand some different perspectives, we will get it wrong. And we will leave things out that are so important or we can't bring those other groups in to our bigger tribe. And I don't want to do that. Um, last year at Force 2017, I was in a room with a few people and it was one of those like earth changing experiences for me. And we sat there and we talked about the different needs of different people in different parts of the world. And my mind was blown away at some of the things I'd never thought about. Um, and so, that's where kind of the idea of this came from. But I also work with the working group four in the scholarly commons, and we're specifically looking at technology. That prompts a lot of conversation where we look at technology, a specific technology, an infrastructure or a tool, and we say, why does it matter? And what can we learn about the bigger picture by looking at this one little tiny, tiny thing? So today we're going to look at tiny things in terms of scenarios. 
situations, experiences that you have had or that someone that you know has had um, that we can learn from as we go forward. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to talk about some scenarios. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to think. You all have situations that are hard things to deal with in your work. The, for most people, that's what drove you to come to a group like Force 11 and come to a conference and learn something. You had something that was hard and you needed to deal with it. So I want you to think of something that's a little bit of a challenge for you, but I want you to think of something that's specific to you. Something that might be a little bit different than anyone else in this room. So you have like 30 seconds to ponder and then we're going to move from there. Okay, if you will take the time to jot that down, if you don't have anything to write on or a laptop or something, I do have a handful of sticky notes. You're welcome to grab one now or grab one at the end. Um, jot it down. At the end, there will be a link. You can go in and stick your scenario in a document that we've created in Workgroup 4. We'd love to have your scenarios and have you talk at, amongst yourselves and with others in that working group about situations. Okay, you have that look of question. Yeah, what's your question? Okay, a little more specific. There is no specificity. It's whatever. Examples. <laughs> examples. So um, an example. I'm a full-time mom, but I started investigating a disease that my child has. And I really want to share that with somebody else so that they can learn what I learned and not have to go through my same pain. That's one example. By the way, that's not my example. And that's okay, too. So anything, whatever situation that you've experienced or so, someone that you have seen experience that you know is a challenge. Um, now, what we're going to do is we're going to play a little bit of musical chairs, but not really because you don't have to switch chairs. But I need a few volunteers that think that their perspective, their scenario, their situation is maybe different than anyone else in the room has likely experienced. or that the scenario that they came up with, even if it's not their own, is a little bit different than anyone else in the room has likely experienced. Please don't be shy. You need a <laughs> if you need a sticky note, he'll bring you one. You think you've got one? Or you need a sticky note? Yeah, if you, if you write it down. And you can leave the sticky notes here, or you can put, them, you can put your thoughts in the Google Doc. I'll give you the link at the end. So I want you to just be thinking right now. So, who has a scenario that they're willing to share that we can talk about? All right, Daniel, thanks. Here you go. Um, yeah, I just jotted it down. That's the first thing I did on the paper here. Here, Fiona, will um, you pass that? Oh, thank you. Um, and I wrote, I would like to share my patient data. Uh, when we discuss patient data, we always assume that uh, this is the most secret thing and uh, nobody should ever see this in public. On the other hand, there are certain conditions, especially rare diseases, where it's basically the only chance for the people. And uh, so all the regulations that exist around sharing patient data, they, can, um, they work against uh, this use case. And so I would like to bring this up as one perspective. Perfect. I love it. Thank you, Daniel. And it is. It's a little bit out of the box. By the way, that picture that was up here, the box is only just because that's so I could put it on the screen. There isn't a box. I want you to think outside the box. That's the whole idea. We're starting from scratch. So thank you, Daniel. Okay, now we're going to go to these key questions that I've m mentioned up here. But I need you to read this third one with me. I'm actually going to read on the screen, which I think PowerPoints, by the way, not my thing, because you can all read. You're scholars. You can read. Doing all of that, all of these things that we're doing today, we're going to do it in such a way as to open, not narrow thoughts, and we're going to invite diverse perspectives. So we are going to help each other keep very open-minded. If someone starts feeling like their mind is starting to close in and narrow off, stop it. You can change that. So that's going to be one of our goals today. So. Here are some of the key questions. So we're going to take Daniel's scenario, and we are going to talk about what are the assumptions. So he already mentioned there's a very, very ingrained assumption. Client data, patient data, it has to be kept secret. It has to be kept confidential. And there are laws and rules that guide that. So that's an assumption. It's a big assumption. What are other assumptions? 
what are other things, what are pieces of what is what Daniel wants to have happen? What are the pieces? Who are the players? What are the things that are involved? So, okay, what we're gonna do, you can either shout it out really loud, raise your hand and grab the microphone, or you can come up here and talk into this microphone right here. So, any of those is fine. If you wanna just shout it out from where you are, I'll try to repeat. If it's short, if not, we'll pass you the mic. Will you pass the mic to Peter? So any of these questions, I want you to just be looking at them, thinking, and start. I want to start analyzing and thinking together as a group and getting at the heart of what Daniel's talking about because they're really important. Like, I think everyone here can recognize that there are some really important things in what Daniel just threw out to us. Like, this isn't a fluff of nothing idea. Like, I just want to ride a unicorn. We're not talking about that. We're talking about life and death. Like, this is a big deal. Okay, Peter. So, so, so I mean, so this is an assumption. And, and you, yourself, cannot share your patient's data. But the pa patient themselves can share their data. And this is a project that, no. yes, they can, they can get the CD from the, from the, I actually talked to someone who was running the uh, Human Brain Project here. And, and, uh, it, and this is a project that we're working on, is how can patients become scholars? How can we use the tools that we are, are, are uh, of creating wiki, uh, creating a private space, having a, a working on a, a presentation, a story, and and have them at various levels publish it, maybe at an anonymous level, so you don't have to write the full book. You could you can have a, a journey, a patient journey, captured first privately, then in a portfolio that could be shared with the physician, and at some point in time, all that documentation, uh, which the patient has the right to get a copy of, is formulated in a way that becomes accessible and citable and, and, and searchable and findable. So it becomes fair data Perfect. for the scholarly uh, ac ac action. Perfect, so let me, let me point out that you just helped us all recognize that one of the assumptions is that Daniel is the scholar rather than his patient could be the scholar. And that's an assumption that I think we often have. Uh, by the way, as the full-time mom, that's my main job. I feel a little like duck out of water sometimes when I try to approach scholarly things. But I think if we recognize that there are many players that could play that role, that's a really good assumption to recognize that we are maybe blinding ourselves to other opportunities. Okay, Fiona. So hi. Um, so I think there's an assumption that, that patients don't want to share. Mm, um, I think because partly, um, certainly where I come from, there's you know, periodic breaches and everyone gets really upset. Um, but I think there's also I think there's some work being done by Nigel Shadbolt. He's doing some, some work on, um, if you like, trying to um, uh, reattach um, our, our own data about ourselves to us in I a sense that. of um, actually, if it's, if it's data that pertains to us, in a sense, we, we um, should have more control over what it's used for and the licensing and so forth. And, um, and to think about if the, you know, if, if, like, if people are um, aware of potential uses that the data can be put to and what the outcomes might possibly be, then um, they would perhaps be able to take charge of the permissions. Um, for for the use of that data, and it might involve as well, um, you know, with my data that, that Facebook uses, I'm happy for them to use it as long as I get some money, or, <laughs> or whatever. Fair enough. Um, but but I, I think it, I think it is also a case of I mean I um, again it, this may or may not be a personal anecdote, but say there was a family that was um, uh, doing a family therapy course, and part of that was that they were filmed. Um, for for that, and then at the end of the the, the course, all the film was destroyed. Um, and, and it's even though the family in question was actually well, you know, if it was for research purposes and it wasn't sort of spread on the internet, or whatever, that actually why why would you research, why would you destroy it when it when it could be used to you know help support or train or whatever? But I think there's there's this assumption though that oh well it's it's the personal data about you, therefore it has to be destroyed. I love that. The, the, and I think that's a really good assumption. Well, and I think that maybe that is maybe a fundamental assumption that might be a worthwhile assumption, that we all want to feel like what is part of us, we have some say in. So maybe that's an assumption that is a good assumption to get to. One of those at the heart things, one of those base understandings that we need to have, that people want to be able to have some right 
we assume that the right that they want is that it'll all be closed, it'll all be destroyed, it'll all, no one will ever see it, but maybe assuming that they would like to have a say in it would be a good assumption. Maybe not, but I, I really like that. I, I love that, that thought. Yes? Um, should we move to another scenario? Um, well, let me ask if there are any other, uh, other questions up here that have sparked any thoughts related to Daniel's scenario before we switch scenarios. Um, how about over here first? One, one, obvious, one obvious hurdle is that people don't want their information disclosed because they can be cut from insurance. So changing, mm. like if, especially in the US, of course. Right. <laughs> so changing the insurance mandate is definitely one of the hurdles. That, that is that. definitely a hurdle. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Just, um, many insurance companies now are giving you discounts if you um, uh, have an activity tracker. <laughs> You know, the insurance oh, okay. company wants to save money. Uh, okay. So there, there's ways of incentivizing. And why should we care uh, 30 cents out of every dollar in the States and maybe 20 cents out of every dollar in Canada is spent on health care? And it, the, the return on that investment is unclear. Okay. And um, <laughs> so there could be, tra but by the only way that we'll be able to discover the impotency of the healthcare system is for people to tell their stories in a way that's evidence that can be documented, that can't be dismissed. I like that. Well, and I would say another reason to care that I would have if I was in that situation, if my child was dying of a rare disease and that could maybe help some other family to not have their child die of a rare disease, like that just feels good. <laughs> that's a why I would care. Yeah, Daniel. And then we'll move on to the next. I, I would like to uh, add another perspective to this. So it's not just that about that individual patient or their, their child. Uh, so it, uh, people who have used this strategy actually, even sometimes even against the laws, uh, they have put out their data in order for other people to be able to find them. So especially in rare diseases, often there is no name for it. The uh, doctors simply don't know what it is, and they don't have enough data to actually come up with anything. Right. And so you, you put out the data, and the data then helps you find other people that have similar data. Then you can actually start uh, serious research. And right. so the constraints is you don't know who the others are. You, uh, you don't have enough information. But if you keep it closed, then it's, it's sure you will not get uh, additional information. And if you put it out, then there is at least a chance that you get something. Perfect, yeah, for sure. OK, we're going to pick another scenario. Does someone else have a scenario uh, that they feel like would be worth <laughs> discussing together today? If not, I have one from an earlier session. Anyone have a scenario that they want to share? Go ahead, please. That'll be perfect. We'll go through. I don't know if it's that original, but uh, before we had all this publication of negative results, I think a very simple scenario is I'm doing a research of something that's been tried and failed before, and it's a waste of effort <laughs> at a very simple level. And I think more generally, uh, you try something and people already know why it might not work. And I think publishing, pre-publishing pre uh, research projects and in a way that's findable could help people know, oh yeah, well, this is not likely to work before. Maybe it's wrong, maybe, you know, that mm -hmm. might. Anyway, that's a perfect one. So what are, so let's, this is one of my, oh, sorry, we've went, we've gone to sleep. Um, <laughs> hopefully you're not all asleep. Um, the first question of what are the assumptions, I think one of the assumptions is that the normal and natural approach is to not publish negative results, which I think has been bred by the system that we're in. I don't know if any of you were in, oh, I can't remember his name yesterday, but he started out and he sh had these great gifts of latter experiences gone badly um, in his session. But there are these two girls that are hauling a ladder up behind them up the stairs. And it looked like the most awkward experience I've ever seen. <laughs> um, but I feel like a lot of our current system is that ladder. And we're trying to drag it up the stairs for no one knows why. A lot of the pieces of our system are not really doing us any favors. And so I think that that is one of those, maybe one of those ladders that maybe we should let go of and just climb the stairs since they're already built. Um, so that's an assumption. What are other assumptions? What are other, so where that assumption comes from might be a little bit different today. There are ways that we can publish our negative results. We can do a preprint. We can, um, 
for anyone that was in the Big Fish, Little Fish uh, class yesterday across the hall, um, we can do this in bite-sized pieces so that someone can tell us, oh, I see where you're going with this, and that fish is going to bite you, and you don't really want to go there. Um, so what are other, what are things, so here's one, what is actually needed? Anyone? What is actually needed? Daniel? I would like to have something like a registry of things that have been tried. Because oh. if you put it out in a preprint, then it is enclosed in another box. It might not be black, but it's still not very usable. <laughs> and uh, so we don't have actually ways to tell the world uh, all the things that have been tried that, uh, that are close to what you're just about to try. And okay. uh, so that's a missing piece. So maybe breaking this down into smaller pieces. So this is my question. This is the idea that I have, what I think my method's going to be to approach that, and being able to have that part even being fair and open. Yeah. Uh, what I think is in Sorry. Well, uh, what I think is important is very much to have these a representation. We both work in semantic web and having these right. representations so it's searchable so we can find uh, autom and sometimes automatically that right. maybe it's not obvious the link between this research we're doing and how this other research might contradict it before right. we even start. Well and I think we can't find it all, right? No. Like, as people, we're not going to find all of those things. We're not even going to know where to look. It's one of the powers of the semantic so, web. So. Is to make those connections that we're not going to find. So any other thoughts on this one? Yes, right in front of you. I just want to build off of what was just said. Um, so you can also like super connect people in the same way. Um, so researchers who are working on um, you know, like seemingly like disparate um, pieces of research that actually you know, uh, can go together to form, uh, like that, that haven't already been done, but you know, like the expected like results you know can be synthesized to form some new like important piece of knowledge totally yeah. well even in from a different field right this field is using very similar methods to what i'm going to try right here but it's in this totally other field i'm not going to find them okay over here what if you come up here <laughs> you'll probably be faster than him okay um so i was thinking along the lines of what what would good look like and for me i think I work a lot with like or graduate students and postdocs, and I think some of the struggles we see are them wanting to do this kind of stuff. Like, sorry about that. <laughs> the speaker issue. Wanting <laughs> to 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 publish negative results, to do that kind of stuff, and it's just not at all like their PIs are saying, no, no, just just don't do that, um, because it'll look bad on your CV. You're not going to get tenure. Um, so for me, when I think like, what does good look like? It's it's that stuff being recognized as important and as valued and having you know these these structures in place that say hey it's just as good to save all these people work um, because you said oh this couldn't be done and now I don't have to do it um, and then that's something that's valued as well well and I would say that there are a whole lot of assumptions there right like there are a whole lot of assumptions baked into that and and that maybe the good is that we're sharing all of our research and that we're being open with that. That's another form of open that I think maybe is another step we could maybe take. Um, OK. When you've only got 25 minutes, you got to go fast. So um, these are just two quotes that came off of either the Scholarly Commons Working Group site or the Work Group 4 site. Um, the culture that we envision for the Scholarly Commons will not just happen. It's not going to happen. And it's not going to happen if we keep in the same mindsets that we've always been in. It's not going to change. We have to be able to really look deep and say, what is it that is at the heart of what we need that is a human need, not just a need of my system and my tenure board, but what is that human need that we all can share and build on top of that? Um, this is from the Work Group 4 site, but we would just like to ask anyone that is interested to help us to reimagine scholarship and define the scholarly commons. If you are at all interested in joining that, I will put up a bunch of links in just a second. But what I would like to ask all of you to do as you leave here today, and if you have any other scenarios that you want to share with me, you can leave them up here if you have a sticky note, or you can put them on the link. But also to ask yourself, 
What is that baby step that you can take? It might not go quite as far as what Kristen Rattan was saying yesterday. It might not be a group effort yet. We might not be quite there yet. But what is one baby step that you personally could take to make a difference, to make a change, to take one step towards having a mindset that is more commoning and more open to bring in all of those other tribes as you work within your own tribe. And here are those links. You're welcome to them. This is where those scenarios can go. That funny tiny URL that I made up this morning. Um, it's just a Google document. You can put yours right at the very top and then um, feel free to look at the other scenarios there and make comments. Comments so that we can interact with one another and we can continue the conversation and try and find out what is really at the heart of what we really need so that we can work as a commons together and hopefully see some change over time. So thank you very much.